People who have been to Chernobyl. What horrifying secrets do you know? After exploring Chernobyl, I discovered that the disaster was a cover-up for something even more horrifying. It's nothing like what you see in games or horror movies. There are no ghosts, mutants, or radioactive anomalies and death isn't waiting for you at every corner. Actually, I think it's one of the most peaceful and prettiest places on Earth. When my friend Alexei decided to go there, he knew who to contact. He wanted to go the extra mile for a school project about nuclear meltdown, so we took a trip there. The deadliest trip of my life. We were driving on some dirt roads in a forest east of Pripyat when we found it. An old rusty fence and a chain gate that blocked any further passage. There was a big sign with the radiation hazard symbol and captioned restricted area authorized personnel only. There was a pair of massive metal blast doors in the side of an artificially looking hill not far behind the fence, with a large white O13 painted on it and no entry sprayed on top. What do you think it is? Alex asked. I don't know, it looks like some kind of bunker, I replied. The both halves were welded shut in the center. Alex took his samples and readings, but we were too puzzled to leave just yet. We circled the main entrance to try find other means of entry. The day was already coming to an end and it was slowly getting darker. As we were searching, a thought crossed my mind. Why would they weld the doors? What's so important inside that they went this far to keep people away? Look, there's something there. Alex pulled me away from my thoughts. It was a concrete block a couple of meters large with what looked like vents on the sides. As I looked into the vents I noticed that they were also sealed with heavy looking steel hatches and no clear way to open them. However, there was also a somewhat smaller door labeled service tunnel with a large wheel on the outside. At first the wheel wouldn't turn because of all the rust and dirt, but eventually it budged. The door unlocked, I pulled and it slowly started opening. Behind the door there was a small platform and a tight vertical tunnel with a ladder. What caught my attention was that there was an identical locking mechanism on the inside that meant that they could lock the door from both sides. But why? We were lucky because if they had locked it from the inside too, there would be no way to get in. I stepped inside and shined my phone light down the shaft. It wasn't strong enough to hit the bottom, the air was damp and old and there was something that I couldn't identify. A very faint chemical-like smell. There was no radiation nor signs of any other hazards. You've got to be kidding me. This is so cool, we have to come back here and check it out later, Alex said. I couldn't agree more. It was almost dark now, so we resealed the door and called it a day, but we promised ourselves to return. I immediately tried to do some research when I got home, unfortunately with no success. I texted my smart friend Pavel about it and he said he would look into it and ask around. A week later we packed our gear and went on with it. We brought some rope, heavy flashlights, glow sticks, Geiger counters, waterproof protective clothes and oxygen meter, and a small emergency scuba tank just in case. We told our relatives and friends about our trip and when we're expecting to return. We closed the door behind us. As we descended down the access shaft, we followed the tunnel and reached another door, but this time it was a regular one, not the heavy bunker type. There was a simple map with the layout of the facility floor by floor. We were on floor zero main entry hall. There were another four floors below us. Floor one, offices, security and recreation. Floor two, secure laboratories. Floor 3, Accelerator Clean Room, Decontamination Chamber, Floor 4 Experiment Site. The map was titled Object 13. It wasn't a military bunker. This was a research site. We took a set of stairs. Since the elevators were of no use without power, I stepped on another stair step, but something rolled away under my foot, lost my balance, and fell on my back. My pack luckily absorbed the impact. I looked under my feet to see what caused my fall. Empty bullet casings. This wasn't the sole reason why I felt odd about this place. As soon as we got down to level 1, I noticed that every single door was open. Every single one. There was a canteen and a kitchen right at the beginning of a long rectangular corridor. Various offices surrounded the corridor. Dimitri Alex called from the canteen on the opposite side of the corridor. What was all I could say when I followed him to the canteen? There was food still neatly served on the tables, but it wasn't spoiled. It wasn't fresh either, but it wasn't decaying as a 30-year-old meal should. How is this possible? I asked. I don't know, maybe it was a radiator or something, but it's not anymore. I checked that. I really don't know, man, he answered, as puzzled as I was looking back. We should have just turned back. There were so many red flags already. Something really wrong happened down there, but I guess we were too excited and curious. We continued and descended down to level 2. The stairwell ended here, and to go deeper we would have to cross the entire floor to reach in another one. On the opposite side, there was a security checkpoint and a large blast door that we had to pass through to reach the labs. Again, every door was wide open. However, the things that people left here weren't neatly placed where they should have been. It was a mess everywhere. There were all kinds of rooms with all kinds of equipment that I didn't understand. Occasionally there were more empty bullet casings on the ground. There still was the one central rectangular corridors above, but the rooms around it were like a little maze. Almost. At the other side of the floor we found the head scientist's office. As I said, everywhere it was a mess, but I found a log book on the desk. There was only a handful of pages, the rest torn out October 5, 1984. Today we successfully managed to translocate several atoms without changes in any physical properties. It's going to be a long road until we can transport solid objects, but we're going some good work here. February 21, 1985, after the animal trials, we translocated our first human. 
Today he is alive and healthy, a brave hero of our nation. We have proven that this technology works. Now we still cannot send matter, only exchange the positions of two equally massive objects. I have proposed a new type of device that could possibly achieve one-way translocation of just a single object, but it would need an immense amount of energy. May 1, 1985 our superiors accepted my proposal. We've now translocated dozens of test subjects. Each one is alive and well, but sometimes they are a little bit, well, different. They sometimes claim that various events in the past happened differently than they really did. Sometimes they claim to know people who don't exist, or more alarming, they know people who they are not supposed to know. The following was written below with a pencil by hand. Test subject 28 was speaking an unknown language and couldn't understand any real language. After the experiment, there was a lot of missing pages. Afterwards, August 13, 1986, we are going to try to change our approach. We are going to try to access the conduit reality instead. Even though Unit 2, the one we built in the power plant, is still new, we are going to use it for this experiment. Who knows what wonders are waiting for us on the other side. There was one last page in the logbook on it. It was just a single phrase written again and again. We let them in. Alex, I think we should go. I called. Come take a look at this, he answered. I stepped out of the lab and back into the hallway. There were clothes all over the corridor. Well, what was left of them? They were torn to shreds. No bodies, no blood, just strips of cloth and an occasional shoe or a watch. I looked up and stared down the dark corridor in front of us. I just stood there for a while. It was, I don't know, as if something torn all these people to shreds and then cleaned it all up except the clothes and other non-organic material. A wave of pure, instinctive dread washed over me. I couldn't move. I didn't even breathe. Let's just get out of here, Alex said. We turned around and walked away slowly at first, but we quickened our pace. Our footsteps echoed across the underground structure. I just want to be out of here, man. We shouldn't have done this, Alex said. I didn't tell him about the logbook, but my thoughts were cut short after a sudden realization, his voice didn't echo. It was just our footsteps. I think he realized too, because we both stopped and listened. Nothing. Just silence. I stepped forward. Clack. I took another step. Clack, there was this door just in front of us, and I forced myself to try something. I closed it behind us as we passed it and placed a glass beaker that I found on the ground on top. I took a step forward. There was silence. It was just echo after all, I thought. We walked away carefully at first, but then we once again quickened our pace. We turned around a corner and then it happened. Crash. The glass shattered. Someone or something just opened the door. We dropped all our gear except our lights and ran as fast as we could. I didn't even know I could run this fast. I always tried to be a tough guy, but I was never so scared of my life. Our footsteps didn't echo anymore, or better said they weren't in sync with ours anymore. Something was running after us. Each second it was getting closer and closer. As soon as we reached the security checkpoint, we started closing the door. The rusty joint of the door squealed in protest, but we pulled with all our strength. We almost had it closed when we heard a loud, guttural, and unnatural growl. The door slammed shut and I threw the wheel to the locked position. My heart was pounding so hard that it was all I heard for a while, but soon I realized it wasn't my heart, it was that thing pounding on the locked blast door. We were running again. We reached the stairwell and run up, taking two three steps at once. We finally reached the air pump room. The ascent really exhausted us and even though I was scared, I felt like I would pass out if I took another step forward. Besides, we locked it down there. Alex sat down and leaned his back on one of the large vertical vents with a bang, 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 bang. We realized something. We locked it down there, but we forgot the vents. The vents that we got in here through. Alex and I looked at each other. Our eyes met and then the vent burst and he was gone. I only heard him scream as he was dragged back down. I feel terrible for doing this, but I just ran, climbed the service shaft, and locked the service door shut. When I was finally out of this hell, as soon as I had phone service again, my phone started beeping with loads and loads of missed calls and messages from Pavel. Hey Dimitri, I found this guy. He says he knows what 013 is. Please pick up as soon as you can. He says it's dangerous and you should stay out of it. Another text. This guy is calling me now. He sounds serious. Please call me back as soon as possible. There was also one message from an unknown number. Dimitri, this is Anatoly Moraz. I know what you found and I'm on my way from Kiev now. Do not go down there. If you already did and you managed to get out. Lock the door that you used to get in and make sure it stays locked. I will try to call you when I'm here. So here I am writing this while I wait. I do this to make sure that no one else repeats our mistakes since I don't know if I'll live long to tell anyone. Personally, I just can't leave Alex behind. I have to go back.